Greetings in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. On this day in which we study Luke 24, 44 to 53, the gospel lesson for the Feast of the Ascension of our Lord. As you know, there are five great feasts in the Christian year, Christmas, Epiphany, Easter, Pentecost, and of course, Ascension. And Ascension and Epiphany, of course, are two of the, the neglected feasts, both because they don't occur necessarily on a Sunday, and Ascension is always on Thursday, the 40th day after Easter. Um, Luke's Gospel and the Book of Acts are the only two places where we have the historical sort of facts of the Ascension, unless you include the end of Mark's Gospel. But Luke, at the end of his Gospel and then at the beginning of Acts, talks about the historical event of the Ascension. In fact, it's the text that is the hinge between Luke and Acts. And so it's really a wonderful text to consider with your folks, and it has within our lectionaries not just the Ascension, which is verses 50 to 53, but also that wonderful final teaching of Jesus to his disciples. So the Ascension text can essentially be broken down into these two sections, 41 to 49, which has to do with Jesus' um, teaching, and then verses 50 to 53, which, of course, is the ascension. Now, I have always used these verses here in both my homiletic and Luke class as a way of teaching people how to preach the gospel. And it is really the end of <clears throat> a way in which Jesus has talked about the passion and resurrection in chapter 24. And in Luke's gospel, it is the seventh rendition of the Passion and Resurrection. There are four Passion predictions in the Gospel that lead up to the, to the death and resurrection of Jesus. And then in Luke uh, 24, there are three what I call Passion statements. One to the women in 24-7, one to the Emmaus disciples in 25-27, to and now this one here that we are going to consider today. So I'm going to spend at least a good chunk of the time on th this first part of the text. And, and I want you to observe here, you can see here on the, on the, uh, the board that there is not the, the entire text, but enough to get us started. First of all, you can see here that there is a day. Now this is unique Lucan vocabulary that describes the destiny of Jesus in Jerusalem. And then there are four infinitives that are dependent on that day. And you can see them here. Um, there are some manuscripts that put another day in here so that we make sure that these are part of the divine necessity. But it's really unnecessary because this day governs all four infinitives. And the way in which it's set up here is you can see that these infinitives, in a sense, encompass everything that we've heard before from Jesus and from Luke about the Passion. But there is this added new one to be preached in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. Now, let, let's, let's get into the text because I, I think it's important to recognize that really the, 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 here you have kind of the, the, the Passion itself. But in this first part, you have the, the kind of the prelude to it. Um, I have done this in other contexts, but the, the connection here between 43 and 44 is seamless. They seem to be on the same day. So this is the text with the roasted fish, you know, where Jesus shows them hands and fish, where they disbelieve for joy. He says, I am to them. And then, then he says to them right away, and it looks like these go right together. These, these are Jesus' final words before he ascends into heaven. These my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you. Okay. Now this is that hermeneutic of remembrance. We saw this earlier in 24, 6, at least in Luke's Gospel where the angels tell the women to remember as he spoke to you while he was still in Galilee. Here it is, while I was still with you. 
th this remembrance is to go back into the gospel and remember what he said. And I think he is, of course, speaking here of the passion predictions. And they are very important. Um, there's two and nine, there's one and 17, and then there's one and 18. So to go back and look at those, but to, to think about what he's done in terms of predicting his passion. Now, it wasn't until 18 that he really connects the passion, the necessity of the passion, to the scriptures. And here, all the things, oh, so important. You see that language in 24, 25 to 27. And, you know, this isn't that golden thread that goes through the Old Testament where you have these discrete references to Jesus. No, this is the entire Old Testament has to do with him. And here he's got it. The law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Now we have heard this language before with Lazarus, and we heard this at Emmaus, Moses and the prophets. And in some ways, this is the entire canon right there, you know, Moses and the prophets. But adding the Psalms is really unique. This is the only time where it's referred to in this particular way. And one of the reasons why I think he refers to the Psalms here is because the Psalms are the most, in many ways, messianic part of the scriptures. And if you really want to know about the suffering, righteous Messiah, the suffering, righteous one, who is the Messiah, then you go to the Psalms. And, you know, I'm a big fan on Bonhoeffer's, you know, the Psalms and the Life of the Church, the prayer book of the church, I think it's called, that Jesus is the one who's speaking all the Psalms, even the imprecatory Psalms, that it's his voice, and that he might have prayed from nine in the morning till three in the afternoon, the entire Psalter, that what he really cites from the Psalter is the Psalms. So you get these little pointers that take you back to the Psalms. And the Psalms are the messianic the messianic text and they have to do with the suffering concerning him you know concerning me the, the the scriptures speaks of jesus the whole thing not just some little thread not just this or that it is the lens the lens is a christological lens that you you just have to have to understand if you want to fully grasp what it's about now having said that now he gets into the core of the kerygma and the core of the kerygma here is, and, and I break, when I, when I talk about how, this is the way to preach the gospel, I break it down into these two categories. Um, that there are two parts here to the kerygma. Let, let's just do the whole thing. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, kind of like what he did with the Emmaus disciples, so they can understand that everything is concerning him. Said to them, thus it is written. So here, based on the Old Testament, the kerygma now comes forth. Here, Jesus is using the, the language of Emmaus. You know, was it not necessary that the Christ suffer? There it is, the Christ suffer. At Emmaus, it's the first time Jesus refers to himself as the Christ. He continues to do that here. The suffering of the Christ is the passion. This is the passion. This is the death. This is atonement. And then be raised out of the dead. He goes back, at least Jesus does, to the more traditional formula. At Emmaus, he has enter into glory, but here it's raised from the dead. So the passion and the resurrection, these are what homileticians call the that. I call them the objective facts. This is the objective gospel. You know, what all the way through Luke 24 is referred to in the neuter, ta, the passion and resurrection facts of Jesus. This is that, that, that fundamental thing, Jerusalem, atonement. Every sermon meet, must have the kerygma. This is the kerygma of the suffering and resurrected Christ, spoken in the way in which the text says it. But then here, this is new. This has never been in any of the passion predictions or statements. To be preached in his name, repentance and the forgiveness of sins and to all nations. Now, th th this is language we've heard before in some ways. 
to be preached repentance of forgiveness of sins. This is from John 3.3. 3. This is what John the Baptism preached. We're going to see later on, this is what Peter preaches at the end of the Pentecost, Pentecost sermon. But the notion of preaching, this is performative speech. Okay. And homileticians call this the for you. Okay. This is where, for lack of a better, this is the application of the gospel. Based on the objective facts of the gospel, this is for you. And it's, the preaching of it means that it is, it is a performative speech that causes the reality of Christ's suffering presence to be present among, in, among the people in the very preaching. That's what the, in his name suggests, presence. So this is, a, this is what I call like a real presence hermeneutic. And repentance into the forgiveness of sins, you know, that, that, that preaching has both a call to repentance and then the application of the gospel based on the atoning death of Jesus that your sins are forgiven you. You receive this forgiveness in preaching, in receiving the very body and blood of Christ. And this is to be to everyone. There's the Pauline gospel, that it is not just for Jews, but for Gentiles, ethne. And it begins in Jerusalem. They are witnesses of this thing. Look at this. You are witnesses of things. You will sit in the city. You know, um, he, he is showing them now of, of their future. This is where he's predicting their future. And, and he's saying that, that they're, they're going to be martyrs for the faith. You can see it there, martyrs. And they will be clothed with power from on high. Now that obviously anticipates Pentecost, where the Holy Spirit will come upon them. Here is where Luke has his Trinitarian moment. And in a way, this is very similar to the ending of Matthew's gospel. It's different. Baptism is here in the name, the name, repentance, forgiveness of sins. There's baptism. And here's the Trinity. Behold, I, Jesus, I am sending the promise, that's the Holy Spirit, of my Father. There's the Father. Father, Son, and Spirit on you. Okay? And again, this is the reference to Pentecost. So it's a, a very clear example where you have, you know, I mean, a rich, rich text to preach on where on the basis of the Old Testament, Moses, prophets, and Psalms that speak so clearly to the suffering righteous one, that on the basis of the Old Testament, the suffering, the resurrection is going to be preached. You have the objective realities of Christ's death and resurrection. You've got the, the application of it for you. Your sins are forgiven you. I, I always say that if you, don't have, if you don't have these two parts of the, of the gospel here, you don't have these two, the, the kerygma, the objective facts, and the for you, you don't have the whole gospel. You don't have the whole gospel. You've got to have both to have the whole gospel. And it has to be, here's where you, what you're doing is you're pointing to where Christ is present bodily, you know, in his flesh, his crucified and risen flesh to, to offer you the gift of repentance into the forgiveness of sins. I mean, that, that is in many ways the key to understand what preaching is about. In all the years I've been grading sermons, I find that most students have one or the other, but not both. You know, they, they have part of it, but not all of it. And, and so many, you know, don't recognize the need to, to have something that, that really does, you know, point directly to the, to, the, to, to the reality of Christ's presence among them. Now, here, from 50 to 53 is the ascension. He bears them out, takes them out unto Bethany, and participle, lifting up his hands, he blesses them. Now, this is the, 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 the Jewish barakah, 
So this is a, the, J- Jesus is in a sense in his Jewish form of prayer, blessing them. This is, uh, you know, we oftentimes, at least as we read the Jewish prayers, kind of feel a little bit out of sorts because um, the Jews bless God. It wasn't God blessing them. But here Jesus is blessing them. Uh, and, and blessing is, is, is a vertical relationship. Makarios is the horizontal, blessing is the vertical. And notice that blessing is used three times in this text. So it's clearly an important word. Came to pass that while he is blessing you, here's the favorite Lucan construction, the accusative as the subject of the infinitive with ento, while he was, usually temporal, while he was blessing them. He departed from them, and he was taken up into heaven. So here's the ascension. The ascension is just like everything else in the Gospels. The big moments are, are understated. They're stated in such simple ways, subject verbs. And they were worshiping him. This is the word for prost, prostrate in front of somebody, to get down on your hands, on your, excuse me, on your face, you know, face to the ground. They are prostrating themselves before him, worshiping him in awe and majesty. Worshiping him, they return to Jerusalem. So they're coming from Bethany. Look at the, the, so this is out, sort of right outside the city. Now they're coming back to Jerusalem. And uh, they, they worshiping, they return to Jerusalem. And I love this, with great joy. Now, if you don't know this, joy is one of the great, themes of Luke's gospel. There's joy at the birth of Jesus. Luke 15, the main theme is joy. Luke is the gospel of joy. He really is. And joy is, I think, one of the things that really distinguishes Luke from the other gospels. And they were, diapontos means continually in the temple, blessing God. We've spoken many times that 1-5, Luke starts in the temple, and here in 2453, he ends in the temple. Now, as far as the, the theology of the ascension, I think this is something that you need to talk about with your folks, that the ascension is where when Jesus ascends into heaven, he takes us with him. So we are now enthroned in heaven in the person of Jesus. So we are in heaven with Jesus now because of our incorporation into him by baptism and faith, by our ongoing, you know, life in him, in preaching in the Eucharist. And so when Jesus ascends into heaven, he takes us with him. And one way to close here, and I think it's a fitting close, one of the favorite verses I have in, in all of the hymns of our church, and I have TLH here in front of me because this hymn was dropped out of, of um, LW and then it came back with LSB. I don't happen to have an LSB with me, but I did have a, a, a TLH with me, and it's, it's hymn 218, See the Conqueror Mounts in Triumph. I think it has another name in LSB. It's a Christopher Wordsworth hymn, one of the great hymn writers. And this is verse 5, perhaps some of the most sublime theology in not just our hymns, but anywhere. And Christopher Wordsworth says it so well. And I will, I will close with this verse. Thou hast raised our human nature on the clouds to God's right hand. There we sit in heavenly places. There with thee in glory stand. Jesus reigns adored by angels. Man with God is on the throne. Mighty Lord, in thine ascension, we by faith behold our own.